All right, welcome to the next episode in our continuing series on special guests here at Behind the Football Stripes. Today, we are honored to have uh, our distinguished guest, Mr. Fielden Covey Culbreth, uh, former Major League Baseball umpire. Um, Fielden started, and he worked his first Major League Baseball game on August 13th, 1993 in Seattle as a call-up umpire, which started an illustrious 28-year career in Major League Baseball and over 35 years in pro ball became a crew chief in Major League Baseball in 2013, I think was the second youngest ever uh, behind Ted Barron, if I'm not mistaken. Um, retired at the end of last year in 2021 with a total of over 3,100 regular season games, only 51 injections in that time, an illustrious postseason career, certainly no stranger to postseason with eight division series, Simon seven league championships, and of course, three World Series. Um, and he also worked the All-Star Game in Pittsburgh, PNC Park in 2006. Currently uh, uh, working as a major league baseball supervisor, working with the minor league umpires. He's a board member on Ump's Care. Certainly one of my favorites. I think the last game that I've actually been to uh, a couple of years ago, because uh, I've been moving around. I think you were umpiring in San Francisco. Uh, so that's my last uh, memory of you and enjoyed watching you on the field. Welcome to the show, our distinguished guest, Fielding Cubby Colbreth. Wow, that is some kind of uh, introduction right there. So uh, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on today. I was, uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that, that you were in San Francisco. Uh, needless to say, I always enjoyed any time that I could get to, to uh, San Francisco and, and enjoyed, quite frankly, enjoyed all the cities over the, uh, as you said, 28 years. Uh, I've certainly been blessed. Well, that's incredible. And for sure. And, and I know most of the guests on the show know you well. Um, but before, let's do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So uh, we were just chatting about this. Should we call you Fielden or Cubby? And what's the what's the best way to reach you? Well, most everybody I know calls me Cubby. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I would say the majority of the players call me Cubby. Uh, as I was telling you earlier, uh, uh, November the 2nd will be 26 years of marriage. My wife at the altar said Cubby. I don't think she has ever, or at least if she's called me by my name, uh, I've never heard it personally. Uh, I've often heard her refer to me as some of the same thing some of the people in the stands referred to me <laughs> as, but uh, but Phil did not being one of them. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, well, from here on out, we're going to call you Cubby because you're part of you're part of our family now. Uh, let's start a little bit more recently. Um, you retired at the end of the 2021 season. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, you're not a stranger to most of the guests here um, that, you know, really admire your career and thought you were right at the top of your game. Um, you, you, I think on the September 30th of last year in, in um score card showed you working a nearly 100% accuracy falls and strikes game for whatever that's worth. Um, so you seem to be at the top of the game. Why, why retire then? And, and how's it been since? Well, first of all, it's like you said, whatever that's worth. That sounds like the machine must have had a bad day that day, if you're <laughs> asking me. Um, you know, it was it was time. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a long career. It's uh, a lot of plane rides, a lot of hotels, a lot of times in the minor leagues. You know, uh, people, when they think of a career, they just think of the big league part of it. But it's, you know, it's been 35 years now. And uh, it was a lot of uh, missed first, you know, first steps first words, all these things with the kids. And, and you know, all of a sudden, here comes COVID. Uh, I opted out the year uh, of COVID just more than anything, just not knowing anything about what was taking place and, and what was going to go on. So I just I, I opted out. And quite frankly, uh, it, it gave me a glimpse into the future that I'm living right now, which is, man, it sure was nice being home for a few things that I haven't been home for in 30 something years. And, uh, you know, being at home for the summer, being with the, uh, my wife for 365 days, I'm not too sure she would be as pleased about it as I, but I enjoyed right. it being in my house, my bed, you know, all the things that, that most people probably just don't give a whole lot of thought to, but, uh, it was, it was the first time that I was home for every one of my kids' birthdays, uh, just small things to a lot of people, but big things to me. And, and quite frankly, uh, it was nice. And then, uh, you know, I was ready and, and just couldn't uh, wait to get back to spring training the next year after the first year of COVID, uh, went out there, uh, was excited when the season started, everything was going good. And, and, you know, just sometime around, 
you know, early August, it just, it just kind of hit me that it just didn't have the same shine to it that it always had. It just, some of the, some of the spark was gone. And, you know, I always prided myself in the fact that, you know, whether I had a good game, whether I had a bad game, I can assure you there was nothing that, right. that I took back in that locker room with me. I, I, I gave everything I had every single night. Um, and I just felt like all of a sudden that might not be the case anymore. If I continued, I called and spoke to uh, my wife about it, Claire. And uh, we talked about were we truly ready. And uh, it took September rolling around before I just finally, it just really hit me that, you know, uh, there just wasn't fun anymore. And man, if you can't have fun walking out of major league baseball field, then you don't need to be out there anymore. So it, it was time. And, uh, and because of that, uh, uh, I feel good about everything because I, I think, I, I think I got everything out of a career. Well, certainly, certainly did. Um, and I think, you know, many people that had to put some of their career jobs on hold during COVID can certainly relate, but it's particularly in, in this circle of umpires, not many people, especially get to work 27 years and then they get a, they get a break. What was that like stepping on the field after a year break? Did you feel like you didn't miss a step, you know, technically and professionally? Um, what were some of the things you had to go through to kind of get yourself back in gear, especially at major league baseball speed? Well, you know, it's just like anything else. When, when you're considered some of the best of the best, doing it with the best, um, you know, any time away. I, and I say this for uh, players of, of, of a professional level. Man, it's, it's, it's difficult when you step away and then all of a sudden you're supposed to, to come back and be, you know, that sharp. The good thing uh, when it came to that is, you know, I went up to spring training. We had spring training the year of COVID. So, you know, all in all, it was a year, right around a year. So uh, I had been doing it long enough in my career, quite frankly, that stepping back out on the field, which I was very excited for, uh, man, it came back in a hurry. Um, yep. You know, it took, usually you get to spring training, you have three, maybe four plate jobs. You have 20, 25 base jobs. And by the time you leave there, if you've seen enough plays, you've certainly seen enough pitches that you're ready to go. And I felt the same way leaving spring training uh, that year as well. So all in all, I, I thought that it was going to take more to get ready. But uh, the truth of the matter, it didn't. Uh, and, and I attribute all that to uh, having all those years of, of leading up to it. that kind of gave me the experience of how to navigate that as best as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you're coming to this decision last year, you mentioned in the middle of the season, August, September, did you talk to your crew at all? I know, I think last year working with, uh, was it Brian Onora, DJ Rayburn and Brian Blakeney? Um, I know you worked with Brian for a number of years, you know, right. you probably had right. camaraderie there. Were they, were they, were they part of the decision for you and helping you kind of come along to make your final decision to retire? Well, it's funny you ask, because I really didn't say anything to anybody for a while other than, you know, I had already talked to a, a number of people about, you know, I was probably going to go another year to maybe three at the most. Um, and then I was looking at retiring anyhow. So, you know, I, I guess I just had the normal conversation with guys, which is, man, it's just, you know, it's, it's getting close to that time and, and all these different things, but it wasn't anything specific uh, until, like I said, when August and, and, and that time, rolled around you know I did share with with Brian uh because Brian and our we're, we're very close I shared with him some of my thoughts uh shared with DJ uh what I was thinking didn't share anything with Ryan because I don't share anything with Ryan <laughs> <laughs> no he's a great guy and I love him to death but uh uh but but yes I did I we started to have those discussions and we started to have them some after the games back at the hotel uh, after the game, maybe having a beer. Uh, so yeah, we did. We started talking about those things and, and how I felt like, you know, this could be, this could be coming to an end, but I don't think that I uh, literally came out and said, I'm done until late, late September. And when that, just one more note on that when you make that decision is that something you notify major league baseball right away about does it affect how they 
sign you for postseason, particularly in that year. How does that work? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't call anybody at the time with anything specific, uh, simply because, you know, I I didn't want to do anything too fast. I mean, there was right. no rush. Uh, nothing said that I had to. And I knew that once I made that decision, that unless something got really crazy, that it was going to be permanent. So I didn't think it was anything I needed to rush into. So I, I waited until I got home, got a chance to uh, speak to my wife. Uh, and, and once I decided that that's kind of where we were, that's when I called the office and, and let them know what my thought process was and, and where I'd be going from there. Well, awesome. And, and again, congratulations on retirement. We all miss you, but uh, we're going to get into a little bit of what you're doing post-retirement in a bit, because I think there's some great stuff there. Uh, now let's rewind all the way back to 1993. Um, August 13th, you got your first uh, call up to Major League, uh, Major League Baseball game, a regular season game in, in Seattle. I think you were working in Tacoma at the time as a, as a AAA umpire. Um, and I think you weren't in AAA for very long at that point. Is that, is that accurate or had you been there a while? That is, that is correct. That was my first year in AAA. And uh, I, had, I had been to big league spring training. And, uh, you know, I guess everybody has hopes once you go to spring training to maybe right. get in the call and everything, but you don't, you don't dare really think it out loud. You don't let people know that that's what you really think might happen. Right. You don't want to jinx it or anything like that. But uh, I remember uh, Bob Christofferson, who was the, uh, the longtime groundskeeper for the Seattle Mariners, but he had always been in Tacoma and we were really good friends. He was good friends with all the umpires, just like a lot of groundskeepers are because we all work together on rain in different situations. Uh, it was one of those shooting star nights, you know, where you have the shooting star uh, just mega burst and all this kind of stuff. And, right. and he had a, uh, a jacuzzi out in his backyard and he asked some of us to come over and, and just kind of sit in the jacuzzi and, and watch the stars and sat over there and did that for a little while and just talked to baseball and the same old things we always do and, and got back after the uh, uh, doing that, got back to the hotel room and, you know, wasn't such things as a, uh, as a cell phone back then. <laughs> right. I got back and the orange light was flashing on the, uh, the uh, telephone, <clears throat> picked it up, mastered it and, and got the message to call Phil Jansen. And I gave him a call and, and he broke the news that I was going to be uh, working not the next day, but the day after in Seattle uh, for my first big league game. So um needless to say it was just a it's 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 every feeling that you think that it would be you know everybody loves to say ah, no nah, it just kind of no nah, it was for me personally I mean I was getting ready to uh you know a small kid from a town of 1500 going to be right. working at the time when the when the uh the the Mariners were having a resurgence so to speak and I was going to be all of a sudden in a stadium with you know, anywhere from 40 to 45,000 would, <laughs> I didn't know you right. could put 45,000 people in one place. So right. it, it was everything that you uh, can imagine that it would be scared, Absolutely. nervous, uh, uh, happy, uh, everything. Let alone at the time, it was still the kingdom, uh, for probably yes. first time working indoors and especially at that scale. And um, uh, yeah, as, you know what? It's funny you say that because I, I really hadn't given that any thought. I had worked one other game in like a uh, breakout spring training game up in uh, Vancouver. They had an exhibition game up there. And it's funny now that I even think about it, it was the Seattle Mariners there as well. That's the one where Edgar, Mar Edgar Martinez ended up hurting his leg. And after that can, was no longer a third baseman anymore. It can, uh, went on to be a, a DH and, and had a pretty decent career at it from what I hear. A little bit, right? <laughs> right absolutely. Yeah. So let's let's actually dive into a little bit more about that that experience, that <clears throat> first day. You know, what is it yep. logistically like to get to the ballpark? Um, you know, had there been anybody on that crew? I, it was Joe Brinkman's crew. Was that was that the crew? That is correct. Brinkman? That is correct. It was Joe, it was Joe Brinkman, Tim McClellan, and uh oh gosh, who else was there? Probably Daryl Cousins. Daryl yeah. Cousins, there you, there you go. go. There you go. I know Darryl they work Cousins. together. So, so the good thing is uh, I happen to know two of them very well, having especially been that I had 
been an instructor for 10 years down at Joe's school. So that was a great experience there as well. Awesome. So what, so, you know, for umpires out there that are moving up to the ranks and, you know, they're going to get calls at different levels. What was that like? I mean, how do you, how do you quash the nerves? How do you focus on your, you know, the precision of your technique and your training? Um, how did that kind of settle in, in that particular game? Well, I guess the only thing I can liken it to is, is that, you know, it didn't happen overnight. You know, it's not like, it's not like you decide to get into professional baseball you become an umpire, uh, you work a, you know, a couple hundred games, next thing you know, you're in the big leagues. Uh, right. You know, in the minor leagues, especially the lower minor leagues, you work a two-man system, and they do that, you know, for a reason. Uh, every other day, you're working the plate, so you're, you're, you're just constantly getting balls and strikes pounded into you, and it's for just to get that, uh, just that everyday look at pitches, every single day you know you get look at pitches and every single day you're you're out on the bases so it's just over and over and over and over and over again every day to where quite frankly by the time you get the chance the truth of the matter is you just got to fight the nerves and everything that would come with walking out on the field the first time and and having to one more time go oh man can i do this but the truth you're you're ready It just depends on, are you ready to do it every single day for the next 25 years? You know, I I think I could, there's days I've had games where I felt like I could put my mom out there for a few innings and she'd be okay because the the guys are just throwing it down the middle. They're everything's that they're swinging, putting the ball in play, all those kind of things. It's, it's all those days are not doing that where you have to be on top of your game to know that you can turn this into a career and not just some, you know, few games here or there that you happen to be able to, uh, to pull this off. Right. And so trust your training and just kind of work. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Awesome. So after 1993, you ended up working, you know, as a call up on part of the next six years, really uh, getting about a hundred plus games a year, it seemed like. And at that right. time, you know, for those that may remember AL and NL umpire staff were split. Um, it seemed like the call up umpires um, for each league were kind of like a predefined small set. I mean, yourself, Ted Barrett, Brian O'Nora, you know, right. folks like Eddie Hickox, I think, you know, you all were kind right. of in the wings. Um, what today it's a little different. I think you kind of see maybe there's more turnover, maybe there's more injuries and whatnot. You get more people up there, especially in recent years. During those six years, how, what was that like? I mean, you're are you waiting for that that call to get hired? Or are you trying to just keep your craft and distinguish yourself amongst those few folks? You are. Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, the difference between between today and and back then was, you know, like you said, there was only four, five, six of us in either league. And, you know, you just worked when the games were available and that's all there, there happened to be. The difference in the American League and the National League at the time was uh, Marty Springstead, God bless his uh, soul, uh, when he gave you a number, it didn't assure you of being a hire, but it was, it was about as close as you could get. So once you got a number, you were pretty much in, in a pecking order that could still be lost. But, but if, you know, if you just went and did your job, you were, you were per, pretty much in an order. And today that's different uh, because everybody that comes up uh, gets a number. Right. And on top of that, uh, what they do today is they, they have a lot of guys that work up and down because they want to have a lot of guys getting some uh, experience here and there. And to get them up to enough games to where, when there is a, a chance to to uh, fill a spot such as mine, that they they have a big number, they have a big group of people to pick from, uh, because they've got the number of games they've worked against the talent they're 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 measured up to. So it's a listen. You can't fault the system then, and you certainly can't fault the system now. Uh, sure. You know, at the end of the day, if you can umpire, you're still going to get your chance. And uh, and the opportunity is going to be there. Become a big league umpire if you can maintain the the skill level to keep it where it needs to be. Absolutely. And and just on a quick side note, there you mentioned getting a number. You have a, a kind of a unique distinction as the only major league baseball umpire, I think, in either league 
to wear the number 42 and the last umpire, I think probably ever to wear number 42 because it's retired major league baseball wife for honor Jackie Robinson. Um, you know, a little side note there. Did that, did that, how, how did that, how did that get communicated to you exactly? Well, the, the way it got communicated to me, uh, quite frankly, scared the pants off of me. I was out cutting grass. Uh, the season had ended. Uh, I was so new in, into the program that uh, there was no reason for my phone to be ringing. It's uh, it's sep- it's it's uh, it's October, uh, late 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 September. I can't remember the exact date, but I can just tell you when I saw the number and the the name come up, I thought, oh my goodness, they're 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 letting me go already. <laughs> I don't even know what I did. So right. I answered I answered the phone, and uh, sure enough, the the guy on the other end. Uh, said, Covey, uh, just want to give you some good news and bad news. And I'm like, well, I've already decided what the bad news is. Right. So anyway, at, long story short, he said, uh, hey, listen, they're retiring the number 42 forever. Uh, they're going to take it from everybody. Uh, they're going to grandfather it in for the people, uh, players that have already had it. But anybody uh, younger than this point, it's it's coming off the board. And we're going to have to take it from you as well. Well, comparing that to what I thought the phone call was going to be about, I gladly gave the number up and uh, right. and said, yes, just th- whatever number you have left, give me another one. I'll take it. So there you go. it was it was kind of weird how it came about. But, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, I'd be lying to you if if I didn't say that I was honored to uh, to have been a person that wore it. I, when the number 42 was first given to me, I didn't give that kind of thought to it. It more so came about uh, actually when they took it. And uh, so I'm, I'm right. honored to have been a, a part of that and, and, and thrilled that every year that they uh, make the recognition the way that they do. Absolutely. I wonder if you, did they grab a jersey of yours to put in the Hall of Fame or, or is that just a side uh, note? No, but I can tell you what I did have over the years. You'd be surprised at the number of players that were number 42 that always loved the unifier, the uh, umpires uniforms that would ask me for a uh, Movon Movon every year, just bugged a, you know, what out of me. Really? You know, could, could he get a jacket? Could he get this? Because right. they, uh, you know, it was their number. And, uh, but so yeah, over the years I've had a, a number of uh, players ask for that. So. Oh, that's quite interesting. That's, you know, yeah. that's cool. That's well, it's like a rare distinction. Um, anyways, back to your career. So in 1999, another kind of unique distinction in your career is that you got hired as part of the mass resignation of the 22 right. umpires across the leagues. Um, and, you know, being kind of a sort of a veteran call up at that time kind of put you in a unique position where you were familiar, very familiar, I would assume, with the AL staff. But now you're hired and now you're part of this larger pool that I think in 2000 became all unified under Major League Baseball. Walk through that experience, what that felt like getting hired. But then, of course, now there's this culture of umpiring that that might be a little bit um, at risk yeah. because of the situation. Yeah, it's, it was it was uh, actually it was quite weird for. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, this is the first time that I've spoke about it in public. Uh, myself, uh, Brian O'Nora and Ted Barrett had been called early in the season. Uh, from from Marty Springstead and then Dr. Brown at the time, uh, letting us know that there had been three people that had uh, uh, put in uh, not their resignation. They were going to, at the end of the season, they were going to retire. Right. And this was well before any of the, uh, the other stuff came out. So he had already made the call because part of the thing was, you know how I told you once you got a number, you were pretty much in line to be hired. Right. Well, Dr. Brown kind of wanted to get away from that. So uh, I guess part of Marty's last request was, hey, listen, these guys have been wearing it. I, I, I would like for these guys to be hired and then we can re-rack and you can do what it is you'd like to do. So um, again, myself, Ted Barrett and uh, Brian O'Nora had been called well before any of this took place, knew that would be hired, was already uh, uh, being sent some of the papers and that kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden at the all-star break, you have uh, uh, the mass uh, resignation and and the rest is history. And I guess the only way that I can describe it is it was um, 
to, to say it's bittersweet doesn't do justice. It's uh, right. um, somebody had, somebody had left for my wife and I's wedding, uh, a bottle of uh, Dom Perignon. And for some reason, the tag had fallen off and we could never attribute it to who gave it to us. So we just wow. left it there. And I said, hey, you know what? The, the day uh, I ever get hired, hopefully if I get hired, we'll bust it open and we'll have a drink. Well, the only thing go. I can tell you is it still sits there and it's full. It's never wow. been busted open because it was, uh, it was a day, it was a day for celebration, but no way to do it with any, uh, it, <laughs> it, it was just a different day. And I hate that for myself, quite frankly. Right. And I hate that for Ted Barrett and I hate it for, uh, Brian O'Nora because, uh, you know, we'd worked awful hard to get in the position we were in, but at the same time, it was a serious matter with everybody else involved. And because of that, you know, I have no problem. You know, it just, the career is what it was. It was a, it was a difficult day. It will always be a difficult day. Uh, I'm just glad that everybody's found a way. Everybody has found a yeah. way to move past it. Well, I think that just lends itself to the character of yourself and, and your peers and, and, and how serious you saw the situation, how much you respected what was going on. It wasn't just a public spectacle that, that many people were seeing. So um, that, that's, that's really outstanding. In, in 2000, you were assigned your first crew and you happened to be working on Bruce Fromey's crew. Completely big pivot from now, you know, and Bruce Fromey being, of course, a longtime NL umpire. Um, how was that adjustment? Was that almost like starting anew again? Um, or was it, or was there a little bit more continuity at that point? No, believe it or not, uh, it was it was quite easy actually, and I'll tell you why after I explain this first. As an up and down guy, uh, it was always my responsibility to understand. In the American League, there was seven, eight different crews, whatever it was. I don't even know what it was at the time. Ten, nine, uh, but the bottom line is there were ten different crews. 10 different sets of personalities and all these things. And it was my job to figure out how they did, what they did, where they worked, how they worked, what time they had lunch, all these different things to, right. to be there to, to fit in with the crew. So uh, all of a sudden being with Bruce was kind of, you know, it was just kind of a conduit of that as well. And at the same time, when, when everything kind of went down in, in, in 99, once they structured everything uh, the way they wanted it to be going forward, they came out with basically a manual of how they wanted all umpires to work uh, the four man system with some nuances that you could, uh, that you could throw out there yourself as well. So, right. uh, you know, it, it, it was just like going to another crew and while at the same time, understanding that no matter what the crew chief could only, could only go so far because it didn't have, he didn't have the, the leeway to just change what was in the manual. Right, right, exactly. And that certainly, I think, probably brought everybody on the same page and made it clear what the expectations were going forward. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, it, and it was, you know, quite, uh, the truth is, it was nothing major. It was just, you know, so there, there had always been some differences in the way that the American League worked and the way that the National League worked. And it just it just brought those things under one umbrella and said, this is the way we're going to do this. This is the way that we're going to do that. But I don't think that it was anything that had anybody uh, upset one way or the other as far as, well, that's too much like this or that's too much like really didn't have an effect. It's, as a matter a matter, in my opinion, it was it was really good because, again, it just put everybody and everything on the same page right there for everybody to see and, and understand. Right. Which I think was ultimately in the end, a great move. Um, I do too. You know, on that same theme, <clears throat> it seems like over the past 30 years, as you span in your major league baseball career, it seemed like there was like three generations of umpires. There was those, you know, when it was AL, NL, distinct characters, distinct personalities, different way of running things. Um, then you got the 22 came in in 99. I think there was like a newer wave. Um, Many of you guys, including yourself, went on to become crew chiefs and, you know, having distinguished postseasons. And, and now I think you're seeing in the past few years this kind of newer wave of umpires where right. it seems to be more consistent in, in um, you know, they don't have the same distinct personality. Sometimes it's hard to recognize who's behind the plate, you know, day to day um, and maybe more attention on certain part of their craft. Are you seeing, have you seen the same thing? And can you talk a little bit about what that was like to live through those, those different periods? 
Yeah, you know, it's just like anything else. Uh, it's evolution, right? Right. Um, you know, every generation gets better and better and better. Very, very seldom in life have I found things that get worse. Not that right. things can't get worse, but typically uh, in today's world, man, with with the the smart people we have and the resources that are out there, things get better. So you know, out of nowhere, they bring in the the Quest Tech at the time, which is the right. The, the pitch tracking uh, system. And then it turns into this and a different name and this and a different name and all those things. So it gave us the resource to, 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 to kind of check your work and, and to bring things uh, to a more consistent level. And, you know, it's difficult for the older generation at the time to, to adapt to it because it was just a totally, it, you know, it, it'd be like all of a sudden asking Babe Ruth to, to hit exactly. a nerf ball as opposed to a whatever it's just right. you, you know whether you're a player umpire whatever at some point you're so comfortable at a part in your career that quite frankly the change it's not that it's so drastic as much as it's just change change and, exactly and, and and do you have time to change and adapt with it and right. you know i was at a time in my career where i was young enough and and was able to do it. And now I'm at a time where this thing is getting more and more and more consistent. And it's, it's there every single night to where that's another uh, reason that it, you know, for me, it, it became time to, to consider going home. It's not that I couldn't do it. It's just right. a matter of, you know, I just don't know if I'm prepared to, to be that good every night because, right. you know, I'm no longer, I'm no longer 45 years old. Right. So, so right. that's, it, that's, how, that's what it was all about as much as anything. And, and, and the only thing that I can uh, tell you is that, you know, today's umpires are better trained and more consistent than ever. And that's the reason, as you stated, it, it's kind of tough to tell who's back there sometime because they're just all that good. I know that, I know that it's, it's kind of, uh, kind of sport for people to sit and try to pick off the umpires are terrible and the umpires. Right. no well i can tell you this if you truly if you truly believe that then you're just not been paying attention and right. that's about all i can say to it if that's you right. truly believe that umpiring is worse today than it's ever been then you have not been paying attention because it is in very 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 solid hands I think that's a really critical point, and especially with such a shortage with, of umpires and officials today in youth sports. Um, you know, this point about you seeing change and and people saying, "Well, is this something I want to go into?" I'm seeing robot umpires come in, in at the professional level. Um, you know, I don't want to be yelled at and and accosted by some parents. You know, takes me down the the, um, the parking lot. I mean, how do you? use that experience to, to encourage folks to, to come into efficiency. Like you said, um, it's, it's the best it's been and professionally. Um, and, and that's a good goal to strive for. I, I have a big concern for officiating going forward. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of these, uh, uh, organizations at the grassroots and, and, uh, as you well are aware of, I'm certain that, we are losing officials left and right. And I'm afraid they're never coming back. You know, it used to be where the, the umpire did football and, and the football guy did basketball and the basketball guy did volleyball and all these things. Well, now everybody's kind of chopped that down to just doing a sport or maybe two. And now they're getting down to none. And uh, right. I hear it. I hear it every weekend. Uh, my daughter was a, a very uh, capable volleyball player. And if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. They're, they feel like they're just a few short years away from not having anybody to officiate the sport. Wow. And, uh, and baseball is, is, I'm afraid that baseball is going to get like that as well. Um, when it starts getting into, you know, how do you advise somebody to get into it or would you and all these things? Um, I don't think the people that, are looking to one day get into it at the level that, that we're talking about right now have to be prodded in any way, because uh, they're thinking at it, they're thinking at it, uh, they're, they're looking at it at a totally different uh, level to start with. Right. So, so I don't think that is really going to change much. 
I'm just afraid that what's going to happen is the people that get in this thing younger are just not, they're, maybe they're not going to have as many of those people that look at it themselves in that aspect anymore. Right. Not, they're not going to need me to prod them because they're just not going to do it. Right. You know, right. Whereas, whereas right. right now, I think there's enough people that, that still uh, officiate and they, they, they watch the games on TV and go, man, I, I think that's something that I would like to do. And, and face it, when, when people quit turning on the, the TV and, and looking as an official at the officials, well, then it's, it's on its way down. It's just, a, it's just a slow spiral to the bottom. Right, right, exactly. And I've heard um, other, you know, pundits and even I think former umpires talk about, you know, a lot of stuff that's happening in the Major League Baseball is sometimes distracting folks from joining the sport, whether they're as athletes or even as umpires. Like, for example, the World Series being held, at, you know, so late in the day, sometimes after 8 Eastern and just to satisfy TV, is, do you think that's also one of the factors that is inhibiting, um, you know, growth and, and acceptance, more acceptance of the sport as we move through these younger generations? You know, it, listen, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, at the end of the day, uh, TV pays the bills. And, and, and yeah. that's just the pure facts of it. And, and we can all be upset with that. We can, we can be whatever it is we choose to be. But you know, the TV people who purchased the rights to, to, to uh, produce these games, um, you know that they're going to show them at a time that's more beneficial for them. And they know the numbers on that. So, I've, you know what, that is a part of baseball that I have never, I've just never stuck my finger in for one simple reason. It's, it, it's just so far removed for what I can possibly understand other than to go everybody's trying to do what's best for the game and at the same time for the business that they're involved in and and i can't look at the tv right. people any differently that's true everyone has a stake and and they're entitled to absolutely. it absolutely absolutely right. yeah that's a good point well let's hope let's hope we get more more people like yourself in there and you know even in the lower ranks because i think um you know you set a really good example speaking of setting a good example um I think in your first year as crew chief in 2013, um, you, you certainly had uh, a little bit of controversy. Um, I think there was a game between the Angels and Houston where yeah. uh, you guys, you know, allowed uh, the Astros manager to remove a pitcher without facing a batter. Um, and yeah. can you walk us through a little bit of that? Because I think, I mean, personally, I learned, I mean, I was, I admired you and your crew for how you handled it, even though I know there was some disciplinary action, but, but I think it, there was a lot to come from that. Talk through what was going through your guys' mind at the time. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's like anything else. You look at it and you think, well, man, it's simple. How do you get that wrong? Well, since the day I got into game until last year, getting out of the game, there's probably been 150 rules changes, if not more. And then there's been a lot of amendments here or there to rules. And, you know, they had started putting in, uh, it used to be real simple. When a pitcher came in, he had to do this, he had to do that. And then all of a sudden, you know, you had where managers got to where they would run a pitcher out there with no intent to use him that half inning just to let him warm up. So this other guy would continue warming up. And then after the half inning was over, and that guy used up more time to warm up, even though he wasn't going to pitch. Well, baseball didn't like the look of that. And, and, and so they changed the rule to where, you know, now you couldn't do this. If a guy crossed the line and he went back out there to the pitch, he had to finish. And he had, so it was the first year they had implemented all these things. And uh, that's what happened. The guy comes out of the bullpen, does all that, those kind of things. And, and quite frankly, uh, it just, it, it, it got away from me. It just got away from me. And then more than anything, you start having doubt. Um, I had the, the rule correct to start with and then started having doubt. And I did a poor job of slowing things down kind of pulling yourself back into, sure. into the now. And uh, next thing you know, uh, if you've been official at any part in your life, you realize now it seems like the whole world's staring at you. Right. You seem like, you seem like, it seems like 20 seconds has been an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, now it just seemed like, all right, well, 
we got to make a decision at this point. Um, you know, I, I told you earlier, I've always prided myself in giving everything that I got because, you know, I, I appreciated my time in baseball and, and they've been unbelievably good to me. And uh, that, will, that will be the only time of my life where I felt like, you know, I let myself and I let my employer down. This, this game deserves better than, than what I gave them that night. Well, you know, certainly on the flip side, I think, you know, it, it, I think it shows that it didn't, it didn't affect your career. Um, you, you had a really illustrious career even after that, a great crew chief. I mean, I think everyone goes through stuff like that. I mean, I don't think there's a single official or, or inside sports or outside of sports. But I think like you mentioned, dealing with something real time in the moment, leading in real time in the moment is not always, is not always trivial. And it's not always just by the book, but I thought the way that you handled yourself and your crew were there any lessons that you kind of took your crew by or took to your crew after that and said, Hey guys, is there anything we want to do differently going forward? Or was it just, it was just kind of like, this was a situation we were going, we know we're better than this, or we know we can keep, we're capable. No, I think it's, it's just like any other thing in life. Uh, you know, I've, I've told anybody that I ever spoke to uh, in, in, in my life and, and, and the young umpires that I'm dealing with now that, Hey, just remember, uh, it doesn't take anything spectacular to, when you're dealing with easy, you know, exactly. it, doesn't take, it doesn't take spectacular that day. <clears throat> it, it takes a lot when you're dealing with that adversity. Uh, I know that the bigger lessons learned in my life came from mistakes, came from yep. really messing some things up. Uh, hopefully they just didn't get so far out of hand that it, that it had some long lasting effect on anything. But from that day forward, I always, put one person on my crew in charge of uh, making sure to go, Hey, Cubby. Okay. Let's slow this thing down a little bit. Right. Just, in, just in case I was trying, even though, cause listen, 99% of the time I know what the answer is. So let's just go give the answer. Right. But I, I still wanted that person to go, Hey, slow down. Let's make it. So, so DJ Rayburn was my slow down guy. Gotcha. And, uh, and, and uh, even though he had far, far, far less time on the field, I told him, I'm only going to be upset when you don't do what I ask you to do. Right. I want, right. You to slow, I want you to slow us down and make sure that we talk everything through that we need to, to get talked through. And he did that. And because of that, we always worked everything out and, 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 uh, and everything was good from there. So, so yeah, that's, that's what I learned is that, you know, it's just like anything else. It's just like at the traffic light, all of a sudden, when you're stuck out in the middle, you feel like, oh gosh, I got to go. I got to go. I got to right. you know what you, what you need to do is slow down for a second and kind of look around and assess the situation. Totally. Totally. So that's what, uh, that's what I learned from, from it more than anything is to have somebody uh, that's in charge of just saying, Hey, right, wrong, or indifferent. Let's kind of pull back here and get, the train back on the track and go from there. Yeah. And I think that's such a, a really astute point, and especially in officiating to always slow down. I mean, the game is going to be moving faster and faster. And even if you're not in officiating, right. To just is a great lesson in life. Like you said, to just, um, you know, not, not necessarily let things just get away from you, which I think is, is a really important lesson for, for all our viewers, for sure. Um, and in, the, in that same kind of light, um, you know, replay became a more dominant factor in the past 10 plus years, Major League Baseball. Um, do you feel that your time working in the replay center uh, helped um, help reinforce some of your training? Uh, of course, you're going to learn some things, but did it reinforce and, and what were your thoughts on that? You know, I, going into it, and I was on the board of directors of the union at the time. And when we negotiated replay and how it was going to look and feel and all those kind of things, uh, needless to say, you really didn't have any idea of what it was going to truly end up being and, and look and smell like and all that kind of stuff. But man, at the end, uh, I found it to be a really good place because it is one of the few times during a season that you have two crews in town. And I believe I spend more days during that week, talking about umpiring, talking about right. positioning, talking about plays, because we're watching all these games and we're watching these plays and we're watching all these things take place. And it gives us a chance to talk about with people you don't see every day, 
angles and how you get there and what you do and all that. And uh, man, I found it to be quite beneficial. And uh, what I found out more than anything is what I told you a few minutes ago, man, we are damn good at what we do. And I challenge people yeah. to remember this. I think people lose sight of the replay room because they always go, well, look at there, that play got overturned or this play got this, or this play was that, or this, here's what I challenge you to remember and think about. Think about the hundreds of thousands of plays that never make it to that replay room because we're the ones out there officiating it and they don't get there to where if you just ran any person out there that thinks they can just run and do the job, that phone would be ringing. They'd have to replace the phones every other month. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, and, and, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and, and, and because of the people that, that, that we have and, and my colleagues over the years, uh, those plays never make it to that room. And, and I think that gets lost in the shuffle, not, not the overturns and stands and confirms and all those things. It's the ones that just never get there. Right. Exactly. And at, that is such a critical point. I think, especially for folks that want to armchair it and, you know, say, Oh, that was a bad call this and that, but you know, it's interesting because umpires aren't trained to be replay officials. They're trained. You're trained to be in a certain right. position, react in real time. And, and like you said, slow things down. Um, did, was there any training that had to go into like, I mean, watch these videos and kind of look at the angles, you know, and from yeah. an analytical way? Yeah. I mean, you know, just like everything else, it kind of evolves, you know, the, the I, pretty much the first day we go in, we're, we're just kind of looking at it like a fan, you know, we're right. just basically watching the TV and saying, well, he looks out to me or he looks safe to me. But then you 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 go there a couple of times and you start looking at it a little bit more critically and and more than anything have to understand the play's already been umpired it's already right. been umpired don't become the umpire your job is to 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 go with what the guidelines of of uh the replay room set which are it's either clear and convincing which makes it either a confirm or an overturn and anything in between that makes it a stands and right. yeah. that's what you have to do because it's easy if you don't watch it to get in there and want to umpire the play. And again, the play's already been umpired. Um, and, and, uh, and I found myself early on kind of going, well, I, I'm pretty sure, well, that's, that's not what my job was. It's the job of the people doing the broadcasting to get the video to me that shows me how he was wrong. If you've got something different than what he's got, then you need to produce that and give it to me as quickly as possible so we can right. make the proper call. And uh, and they do that now. You know, at first it was new for everybody, not just the umpires. It was the broadcast uh, people, uh, the replay room. It was new for everybody. So, you know, uh, I remember early on, there was a couple of instances where, you know, two innings later, we found out they found a new look at the play that we had just confirmed that showed that it might've been missed. Well, right. there's nothing, there's nothing you could have done about that at the time. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, everything gets there now in a split second. It's just like everything else we've been talking about. It evolves, it gets better. And, uh, and that room now is, 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 is as good as it can be. You know, there's always going to be people uh, no matter what that just, don't want to see it that way. They don't want to hear it that way, but that is what it is. You just don't get to go in there and make it up. Right. You know? Exactly. And, and sticking to the so-called the facts, right. And, and the rules right. are not trying to like overthink it, I think is a key lesson. Well, before we get off the field and talk about some of the stuff you're doing post-retirement, well, now just close out with um, uh, this week, of course, the world series starts. So kind of let's talk a little bit about your world series career. You were lucky to work three world series, um, 2008 between the Phillies and, and Tampa Bay, 2012 between Detroit and San Francisco, and then 2018, that, that uh, series between Boston and LA, I think, which had one of the longest uh, games. I think Ted Barrett was behind the play for that one. Um, they had the right man at the right place. <laughs> right man at the right place. There yeah, you go. that's exactly right. Absolutely right. Um, and and in actually in that one, you actually rotated from replay to the field. So I've got to be curious what that's like, because that's got to be, that, that's certainly not something you do during the year. Um, 
first of all, any you know, what is the, your biggest memory of working the World Series in your three times? Well, I, I, I kind of take it back to just like it was working that first game. It, it is everything that you that you think that it would be. Um, right. You know, it, it doesn't take long to realize uh, when you walk out there and, you know, you typically look at the scoreboards out there on the outfield fence and there's, you know, there's 14 other games taking place and, and then there might be some college football games in September up there and all these different things. Yeah. All of a sudden you look out there and, there's your game and that's right. it. You're the only show in town and you know, all the pageantry and everything else that comes with it certainly does not give you the opportunity to, to miss what's going on. So right. it's, uh, you know, it's exciting. It's exciting to, to think that this is the culmination of, of putting together uh, a good career, uh, doing everything that you uh, had hoped to do. And uh, and ultimately uh, being rewarded with the chance to uh, to walk out there and, and to officiate what I think is the greatest sport on earth. So it's uh, it is it's everything that you would think it is. And and uh, for people that have a lot of hair that they appreciate, it's a good way to lose some. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Absolutely. How long did it take you to settle into that first World Series game? And uh, was it was it in Tampa? I think they started in Tampa. It started in it started in Tampa, um, and it was just like anything else. It's you know kind of once pitcher two got to going, everything was fine. The big thing was the uh, the plate. I have you know uh, because of my background playing and different things, I'd been on baseball fields my whole life. So um, during regular seasons, things like that, I just never really got I, I never really got too jacked up one way or the other as far as a plate job or anything else. I just kind of went out there and did the, uh, uh, the game, but for some reason, and I have no idea what happened to me that day in Philadelphia. Uh, it was my night to work the plate and I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything. I played that game 20 times in my head before I ever saw a pitch. Oh. And, uh, quite frankly, it had drained all the fun out of the thought of going out there because it was, it was foreign to me to, to kind of feel the way that I was feeling. Didn't really know how to handle it. And then sure enough, we get to the park, had a rain delay, all this stuff to start the game and everything. And, and uh, finally we got the game started and it was the weirdest thing. Had kind of had nerves that I'd not had in years and years and years. And it kind of drove me somewhat crazy. And then the second I walked through the gates and actually walked out onto the field was the first time I looked up and went, well, now, hell, I've seen one of these before. You know, right. everything started to look familiar and the, the dugouts had people in them that I'd seen and same people were booing that always boo. And, and it right. was just all of a sudden it looked familiar, sounded familiar, smelled familiar. And, and after about, 10 pitches, just like every single night, because uh, anybody says they don't get something going within, they got to be near death. Cause I, I don't know how you right. can walk out on a big league field and not get something going. I'm not saying where it drives you mentally crazy, but you got to get something going. You're walking out there in front of a lot of people and going to have a, a lot of uh, uh, calls to make. So uh, it was like normal, though, you know, nine, ten pitches into it, it turned into another baseball game, and I settled in and just called what was thrown up there. There you go. Your training coming right back into it. Just that's, needed to see something normal. I needed to see something normal and, and not play it in my mind as opposed to right there in front of me. Gosh, we've all been there, right? We've all been there one yep. way or another. Yep. Um, and then lastly, you know, in the in your third World Series, you mentioned you rotated from replay – to the field, something you don't do during the year. Um, right. And I know they've changed the format a little bit since then, but what was that like? Cause you would have been scheduled to work game seven behind the plate. Um, I think right at that point. That is um, correct. What was that? Talk about something different. How was that kind of different for you? Uh, you know what it was? It was different to know that you're involved in this thing again. Thank goodness. It was my third one because I was better prepared. Uh, didn't have any more of those nerves uh, this time. I was better prepared to deal with the fact that here it is, the World Series is, 
starting. I'm part of the crew and I'm watching the damn thing on TV. So right. it, it, that part was weird, right. but, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you did the game that night, did whatever. And, and, uh, then I, I left there and went straight to LA and it was just like not missing a, a beat at that point. And thank goodness it only, uh, it only went, I think it went five and, and I didn't have to, uh, I right. didn't have to perform. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, luck, luck of the draw on that one. It was luck of the um, draw. Absolutely, and I'm sure. <laughs> what would so you know the World Series starts in two days. What are some of those umpires doing right now in the days leading up to it? I mean, is there any special preparation or or like you were alluding to it? You just want to keep things normal. It, you know, it by and large you just keep it normal. There will be some guys these days that uh, you know. The weird thing is, is believe it or not. You know, the last game of the season was when uh, September the thirty first, uh, early October. Something like so, that. So, so depending on depending on uh, where you were in the rotation, where you were in the divisionals, you got a guy that might be working a plate that hadn't seen a pitch in a few days. Right. So what the so what they'll uh, go do now is they'll go to a cage or they'll go somewhere and actually watch some pitches to kind of to kind of get back in the swing of that and everything, but. Uh, I can assure you that uh, I never did that, and I never felt the need to do that. Even though there was a, uh, if, had I worked Game Seven uh, that year, uh, it would have been, it would have been about a week and a half to two weeks before I had worked a, a plate job. But I can assure you, at that time of the year, you are dialed in and you're ready to go. And the only thing you need to do is get back behind that catcher and take a couple of warm up pitches and. Uh, you look around and hear that noise, you'll get, you'll get snapped back into reality pretty quick. Pretty quick. Well, a testament yeah. to your training and really, like you mentioned, the professionals that you guys really are and why you are so good at what you do. So um, all the best of luck, of course, to our, our World Series umpires this year. Let's, uh, let's move off the field. So you retired and, and you've re taken a role as a Major League Baseball umpire supervisor working with minor league umpires. Um, what, what, first of all, led you to take that, that role and, and talk a little about what that's like, because we don't hear from supervisors a lot um, or what they do, especially in Major League Baseball. <clears throat> well, uh, when I decided to retire, uh, you know, I was asked to, to stay on and, and maybe consider uh, supervising, uh, quite frankly, at, at the time. And, and I don't think any time in the future either for me, for me personally. You know, I was I was asked if I'd you know do it at the major league level, and that didn't sound appealing to me simply because I when I came off the field, uh, the time away from home and flights and all that had as much to do with it as anything. It's about 180 right. days a year on the road, and and I, I was quite frankly I was just done with that. So the last thing I wanted to do is get out of the game, and then get back in it at a level that cost me another 125 days on the road. Right. So that. That wasn't very appealing, uh, but I started discussing it with uh, one of my bosses and said, you know, you know, I, I'd love to consider it at the minor league level. And, you know, his eyes kind of lit up like, really, you'd, you'd do that. And I said, I would love to do that. Uh, it, I, I live in Landrum, South Carolina, which puts me uh, because of where I am, you know, I've got three or four teams that I can drive to within uh, minutes or just an hour or so at the most. And, uh, and then another couple of teams that are just two and a half hours away. So I'm in a good location to be able to go see, uh, uh, teams in the Carolina and the South Atlantic league. And I was really excited about it because, um, it's just my way of thinking that, uh, you know, I didn't just, I didn't just happen to, uh, to wake up one morning and work three world series and all these things you mentioned uh, earlier, man, I had a lot of people along the way that, that gave me some really good advice, uh, talked to me about different things, showed me something here, or there, uh, bosses that believed in me and, and gave me the opportunity to, uh, to uh, shine and excel. And it sounded like a perfect way for me to take some of that that was given to me and go back to the, the, the grassroots of this thing and, uh, and give back some of what was handed down to me. I, I remember being in the minor leagues, just kind of thinking to myself that 
nobody makes it to the big leagues. That's just what they tell people. You know, right, they, right. we're just down here umpiring minor league games and just wandering around doing nothing. Nobody's going to show up. Well, that's not true. Uh, and and I want to be a, a I wanted to be a part of showing them that it's not true. I am extremely proud of uh, the group of people that I work with right now uh, at the minor league level. I'm the only one on the staff that that uh, actually made it to the, the major leagues. But I can assure you, those guys that are doing it and have been doing it well before I got here, they know what they're doing. They, yeah. throw, they throw everything they've got into giving these guys and girls every bit of knowledge that they have to become big league umpires. And, and quite frankly, that is my, you know, I always set goals as an umpire and uh, I've, I've got a new goal now, which is I want to get one of the first people that I'm able to touch to the big leagues. I want somebody right. that I touch and have hmm. contact with to realize their dream now. And that will, that quite frankly will be, I think the, icing on the cake and when that happens it'll probably be time to hang it up in the supervising uh, realm as well and and move on and let somebody else do it but i've enjoyed it it's been good talking to these young people and 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 man they're just they're just sponges they're just looking for some right. information and and i've in, i've truly enjoyed it just like i said about the working the first game and working the first world series this has been everything that I hope that it would be as well. Absolutely. I think that's a really good way to put it. I mean, personally, I've always seen this thread of leadership in, in officiating. And I think that's what's attractive to so many people, because I think it gives you an opportunity to, to give back and share that craft with folks. And I mean, you were a crew chief. I'm sure you're some of the same things you did as a crew chief with your major league guys, you're doing with some of these minor league guys and just, uh, you know, helping them and, and leading through example and, and stuff. So I think that's, that's really outstanding. And I think that's hopefully something that brings more people to, to the craft in general. Um, I think it's a great profession to, to become a good leader too. Well, I, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm just trying to talk to them about things. You know, I tell them nightly, uh, uh, you know, even though what I'm doing, the people that I'm seeing for the most part are in low A ball to high A ball. So they're, they're about as far away as you can be from the major leagues and being professional right. baseball right now. But, I, you know, I, I, I tell them every single night that, hey, listen, you go out there, you work hard, you do all these things. And you know, it's going to happen for somebody. Right. There's, there's no reason it shouldn't be you. Right. Absolutely no reason. And, uh, but, but you're going to have to believe that I can't want it more than you. you right. Know? So you're going to have to right. go out there and, and put in the time. And, and I just, I've enjoyed talking to him about the fact that, you know, I'm not there to get a guy from a ball to double a, or to get a guy from double a to triple a I'm there right. immediately trying to tell him, Hey guys, Let's think bigger than that. Let's think big leagues. Because right. if you do all the things you're supposed to do to become a good big league umpire, I will assure you that A ball and double A will fall right into place. Exactly. Do you remember, you know, you, you had mentioned you had a baseball career at, at UNC Charlotte. Um, when did that, when you started down your path for umpiring, when did that click in for you? It's like, I want to shoot for the big leagues. Well, I had never umpired a game in my life, and uh, I messed up my arm my senior year. It just so happened that my college baseball coach, uh, Gary Robinson, had actually been in professional baseball as an umpire. So he spoke about umpiring for years, you know, right. that I was there. And, and uh, there was times that I didn't realize at the time uh, we would be practicing in the Charlotte O's, the Charlotte Orioles back then. Um, were, would be in town and all of a sudden they'd be two or three people walk up and uh, Gary would stop practice for us, hand it over to the assistant coaches and he would leave with these people. I didn't know who they were. It come to find out it was some of his ex colleagues. They were in town to do the O's games and they would go out and have a beer after a game or whatever it was they were in town. They'd go visit. And, and uh, so, so I talked to him about umpiring, uh, after my senior year, when or during my senior year, when I uh, uh, tore my rotator, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I was, I guess, I was that guy that went to school, was going to play and do all that kind of stuff, and and uh, didn't put all my resources exactly to where I should have. 
And right. uh, I was I was unsure of what I was going to do. So he said, well, why don't you think about going to umpire school? And I thought, nah, I don't know about that. But I uh, went back uh, after sitting on the bus coming back from the regional playoffs in the Sun Belt Conference. And I stepped back there with my teammates and I said, boys, I'm going to umpire school. And one other guy was back there, Eddie Bean. Eddie Very Bean nice. says, yeah, Eddie Bean says, I'll go with you. And Eddie and I both went. Eddie and I both ended up getting a job. And Eddie Bean, for a little bit of trivia, uh, never ended up working full-time in the big leagues, but worked a perfect game in Major League Baseball. He worked Kenny Rogers behind the plate, worked his perfect game, and then got released like two months later. It's kind of a tough gig there. Right, exactly. <laughs> but, hey, he's, he's got his name in the record books, at he's least. He's got his name. His name is in the Hall of Fame one way or the yeah. other. Absolutely. Well, that's and, and also in, in retirement, you're also very influential with UMS Care. I think you're on the, the board. Um, and, you know, thanks to Amy and some of the folks there for connecting us on this. Um, but, you know, what they do is certainly uh, second to none. Um, talk a little bit about which, what UMS Care is all about and how they're growing uh, in, in their charitable support. Well, UMS Care has truly, not just this year, but over the last probably six or seven years, <clears throat> for me personally become uh for me the the highlight of what i get up for every morning as far as baseball is concerned um you know we took for years and years and years and the only thing we did was was we went out and worked the baseball game went back to the hotel waited till the next day 21 hours later and went and did the same thing again and we just sat around and and marvin hudson uh decides one day that he wanted to start something at the kid at the beginning was called blue for kids. And it was just going to have some people out to a spring training game, some boys and girls clubs, things like that. And just have some kids out to kind of show them around the park and some things like that. Well, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And uh, next thing you know, <clears throat> it's umps care. It's changed names. Uh, it's taken on a whole new meaning. And, and we do some pretty remarkable things now. Uh, because of the generous donations of, 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 of people around the United States. And we're making a difference in a lot of different ways now. Uh, when we first started off, we had the kids program. We would bring them out on the field. Uh, it was uh, at-risk kids. And uh, we'd bring them down. And, and, you know, we're talking about kids that might be 13, 14, 15 years old, been living in Kansas City their whole lives and never seen a baseball game, never knew that Kansas City had a a big league team and right. uh, we bring them there and we give them a, a, a grab bag full of stuff. We put them up in the, the really good seats that the umpires have and the teams participating, giving them part of this, these grab bags that they get. And they get a, uh, they get a little gift card that, that gives them, uh, they can go up to the concession stand. They get to be just like every single other kid in that ballpark that day. And there's mm -hmm. nothing that separates them from anybody else. And, and, uh, that's where it started, and now we've we visited, uh, you know, hundreds of of uh, children's hospital. We've given away uh, thousands and thousands of build bears where, where we go into these uh, to these uh, hospitals visiting uh, kids uh, of uh, of different varieties of illnesses, and and, uh, yeah. and we give them a chance to pick a builder bear a builder bear and an outfit for it, and we visit with them, and and we do all those things, and 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 it's just. It's just been unbelievably rewarding. And now we've even taken it to another level where we have the scholarship program where we take kids that are adopt, adopted later in life. You know, uh, my wife and I adopted, a, our middle child was adopted from Guatemala when she was five months old. But we had, wow. we had our whole lives with her because we got her at five months old to set up for college and everything to, to have her ready to go, just like our other two kids, natural born kids. Uh, right we're talking about kids that were adopted later in life that quite frankly, the parents get them when they're 15. They don't have, uh, they don't have the opportunity to, to save up for them to go to college. Sure. And, and many of them would have never have gone to college and they admit that they would have never gone to college because they wouldn't have been able to afford it. So I don't think there's anything better uh, in life than an education and to, to be able to, give $10,000 a semester uh, to a deserving young man or, uh, or woman and to help them with something that is going to produce for them the remainder of their lives 
has been unbelievably rewarding. And we don't just we don't just hand them the money, pat them on the back, and say, "Hey, there you go. We hope you enjoyed it." Uh, we do a mentoring process with them. Uh, we stay in touch with them. They stay in touch with us. Uh, they call and and ask for help here and there. So it's become it's become a really really nice relationship. And uh, I can just tell you this, Umps Care. Uh, I enjoyed every World Series and every playoff and every one of those three thousand games. But I can assure you, nothing has the impact on me today that um that Umps Care does because it's 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 really an opportunity to give back to some people that are uh, deserving in a lot of different ways and that you're truly making a difference in, in these young people's lives. And uh, no baseball game for me is going to do that. That comes from Hump's care and the chance that I have because of the game of baseball. Uh, certainly true. I, I mean, I think that's very well said and they're a great organization. It's great to see these very heartwarming pictures of you guys, whether it's in the hospitals or on the field, uh, giving back to these communities or contributing to these communities. Um, you know, I, ho I certainly hope people take note. How can people participate in UMS Care if they want to? Um, are there any ways they can go about that? They, there is. If you will just go to www.umpscare.com, uh, there's many things you can do in, in ways of support. Uh, you can put it towards a, a specific event that you would like to sponsor. You can put it in just donations itself to go towards all the programs that, that we have. Um, there's, there's many ways that you can get involved. You can actually even come out and participate in some of the events that we have, uh, the bowling tournaments where we raise money and the golf events where we raise money. And you can, you can, uh, you can meet some of the umpires and you can uh, meet some of the uh, kids that have gone on to become our scholarship sponsors and, uh, and, and things like that. So there's uh, a lot of ways to do it. Uh, needless to say, I'm, I guess this is the point where I will make a grab for it and say that if you, you know, I don't care what it is that you have to give, you will not embarrass us with a, with a dollar donation. We'll take right. anything that you have the opportunity to give because uh, uh, all, anything is always enough. Uh, uh, it, 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 all, it all comes together, goes into the same kitty. And we find a way to uh, spin it for all the programs that we have. And all of them are just doing so well now. And, and like I said, I'm just, I am beyond thrilled to be a part of it and to be a, a board member of Umps Care. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's the best thing that I'm involved with other than, other than my own family. Sure, Umps of course. Care, Umps Care is where it's at. So it's just, it's, a, it's near and dear to me and we'll, uh, we'll continue to be uh, in, until the day that I'm no longer on this earth. Well, I mean, it certainly is. It's a great organization. As I mentioned, it's great to see that. I know a lot of umpires are actually, or, you know, at the amateur level are, are noting, noticing that. And, and like you said, it's a great way to possibly meet some of you guys and, and give a few bucks of a donation here and there. It just goes a long way, especially some of these underprivileged kids and, and or even those that are, that are unfortunately sick or dealing with illness, which we, which we certainly don't ever want to see. Well, thank you, uh, Cubby. Uh, to kind of close out today, just want to do a couple quick fire questions, uh, a couple of things that came from our, our viewers and just some fun things. Yeah. First of all, uh, you probably have probably tops with this, your signature strike three call, maybe second to Tom Hallion. He breaks his back. Um, <laughs> how did that come about? You know what? <clears throat> to be honest with you, I never, I never gave it any thought. And it's not something that I had done my whole career through the minor leagues and everything. Uh, Maybe it was just trying to find a way to get around my big belly, and that was the best way to do it. I don't know, but uh, I just uh, – one day I started doing that particular call, and my goodness, I thought nobody ever paid any attention to me or an umpire or anything, and I don't believe I can go anywhere today. If somebody knows that an umpire, they'll ask me, hey, show me that strike three call. I'm like, well, no, I'm not right. going to do that. But anyway, so <laughs> there you go. it just, it just came out of nowhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, equipment, uh, any equipment preferences that you would share? Say, Hey, definitely use this. Don't use that. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I use the Wilson shin guards. Love them. Um, I didn't realize because I, I had used the same shin guards forever when I first got in the game and I didn't realize it had to, it didn't have to hurt. 
to right. get hit with a baseball. Right. So there you go. When I finally switched, I found out that, uh, man, the technology, just like everything, evolution, right? The yep. technology and everything that goes into uh, to this equipment is unbelievable. The Wilson shin guards, I use the 18 inch or just the gray ones, not the black. The gray ones are unbelievable. Um, I use a all-star uh, <clears throat> IMAX mask and I had a lot of luck with it. I took a lot of shots to the face and had minimal mm. concussion type symptoms over the years. So, uh, you know, it's just like anything else. The, the technology is out there these days, all of it's competitive. It just comes down to personal preference and, uh, and the Wilson stuff for me uh, certainly was a winner. And you, you used to, like in the picture, you used to have the throat guard, I think one of, I guess a handful of umpires still use. Was that something that just kind of stayed with you? I bought, when I went to umpire school, I purchased that particular throat guard that you see right there. Wow. So that, that, that particular throat guard uh, was on any mask that I wore from the first day until December. There you go. Well, it stuck with yeah. you the whole career. That's awesome. Yeah. That's outstanding. Yeah. yeah. Um, favorite city to work? Oh, Not to work, gosh. but like ballpark wise or, or combinations and all that. You know, it, it, it probably sounds redundant to everybody, but the truth of the matter is it's some of the best cities that, that, that our country has to, uh, to offer. I mean, think about it. Uh, some of the nicer cities, restaurants, um, how can you not like going to Chicago and, and, uh, New York and, and San Francisco and San Diego and LA and all these places. And, sure. you know, uh, people always say, well, I bet Cleveland's a little boring. No, Cleveland's not boring. It's a great place. You know, right. it's, it's not necessarily where I would call home, but neither for that matter, I don't think this accent's going to pass in New York either. So, <laughs> so right. uh, New York is not a, a place that I would choose to live, but I certainly loved going there. Right. Um, so th they're all nice in the ballparks. I guess if I had, to, I've always broken the ballparks down to two categories, the old parks, which it was really cool to walk into to the parks that, that you dream of. You know, I, I yeah. was fortunate enough to work into some of them that's been torn down. You know, old Detroit Tiger Stadium and, right. and Texas Stadium. The, the, you know, I actually went through three stadiums in Texas. And right. uh, so uh, I look at the old stadiums, which were great and, and, and meant an awful lot to walk into those places where you think about Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth and some of those kind of names that went, down those same hallways that you were so fortunate to walk down. Um, and then I look at today's parks and uh, I don't know if it's called Safeco anymore in Seattle. I think it's been a change of name, but, yeah. but, but, you know, what a beautiful place. You're outdoors. You're totally outdoors, but with an umbrella over the top. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and you can, you can get sushi. I mean, right. You can, could you imagine going and getting sushi at a ballpark? So that's right. It's, Great uh, ballpark. So you have the old ballparks and then the new ballparks. And, and, uh, and again, I, I, I hate to sound so cook, cookie cutter, but it's, how do you separate them? I mean, how do I, I think of Kansas city, which is an old ballpark now in, in, in years it's old, but that ballpark will be beautiful and been, yeah. and, and still be conducive for major league baseball years from now it's just right. a beautiful beautiful place yeah a lot of people say i have yet to visit <clears throat> that one but I, it's on my list for sure it is um, a beautiful place absolutely typical day for you this has come up in, a, in our in some of our visitors um, ask about what's a typical day for you like any any routines any particular pregame meals that kept you going well uh, you know that's the thing you become a creature of habit at some point because you know you're in these cities so many times over the years that uh you know, you know, them just like, you know, your hometowns. And, uh, so I'm an early riser. I'm a, you know, I'm a six o'clock in the morning kind of person. And, and so I would get up and, <clears throat> and go to whatever local, uh, breakfast joint that, that I had, uh, found over the years and start my day off with some coffee and, and things there. And just kind of, just kind of half tried to do the same things that I would do back home, maybe go out and, yeah and go for a walk in the city and all those things. And then, uh, you know, after the first 10 years, uh, 
all the things you would typically do during the day kind of wound down because you know it's you can only go to the san diego zoo so many times to where right. the pan, when the panda right. starts recognizing you that's not, <laughs> that's not a good thing so right you know you just at some point you truly have seen it all and i don't i, I mean that literally you yeah there's there's nothing new to it anymore because you've been to just about every place that that city has to offer and, and I think some people don't like after you work a big league game, even if it's a regular season game, how do you decompress as a crew? Is it, did you find anything that worked well? Is it each to their own or did you feel like you needed to kind of wind down together? Well, it, that just depends. Uh, again, that's kind of a, that's kind of a crew thing as well. And that goes with time also, you know, when I was, you know, when I was 29 and 33, well, I might go out and have a beer or two or, go to a bar for an hour or so after the game because you know one thing was always certain uh thinking that you could leave a, a major league baseball field at 10 30 11 o'clock at night and go to the hotel and get in the hotel room and go to bed is right fodder you know right. i mean man your gears are on 105 and you just can't turn them off like that so right. uh so over uh, you know when i was younger I might go out and have a beer or two somewhere and and kind of unwind. Um, over the last 10 to 12 years, uh, any beer that I had pretty much took place right there at the hotel, uh, maybe a hotel bar, and it was maybe a beer or two at the most. And right. uh, just kind of unwind and, and talk to the guys about the game or anything that went on, if you happen to be staying at the, the same hotel that they're staying. And, and then, uh, um, my my way of driving was going over and pushing a button and jumping on the elevator and going up to the to the room for the night so right. you know it's it's it again i guess we the theme of the the, the day here has kind of been evolution and right evolution kind of got the best of me as far as what i used to do and what i did towards the end absolutely yeah i was just gonna say that the theme of the day is evolution but ad adapting and and sometimes be, being consistent throughout as and persistent and and waiting your chance and and keeping sticking to your craft well last thing and just to leave with this um first of all thank you very much for for really this outstanding uh chat today it's been a pleasure i know our our viewership will enjoy this what what uh, two things your most memorable moment or time on a field period uh in your entire career number two what's the, what's some parting words you have for uh for anybody that's in the profession right now well there'd be a couple of things as far as uh moments on the field one would be my first world series having my wife there and my youngest my son uh had a, a daughter at the time but the the adopted daughter but she was too young to uh to bring so it was right. you know that's something and have the 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 pictures and things to kind of memorialize it and and remember it and all those kind of things so that was that was definitely a, a big moment there um and then probably the biggest moment on the field as far as just the moment itself was um i was on the field the night that ripkin's streak came to an end right and, Baltimore. You know, that's that's is uh that is that is probably as big a moment as the game will have the offer in a long, long time as far as records go, because I think that of all records in any sport or hell for any category that records could possibly be set, that one I think is about as safe as anything known to man. It could be broken because every record can be, but I don't see how. Absolutely. And I agree with you. As a Maryland native myself, I second that. That's a that's I, certainly I, certainly I, something I, that won't be broken. I just don't know how. And as far as words of wisdom, uh, you know, I'll, I'll end this with uh, kind of more of talking to the uh, to the amateur side of, of, of officiating because um, needless to say it, 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 it it's going to touch more people that, that will understand it. Um, you know, I've told you that every single game uh, I went out there and umpired, I, 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 I truly gave it everything that I had. Uh, I was fortunate enough that the only game I ever umpired in my life was the professional level. But I ask and challenge every single amateur official, no matter what the sport is, officiate that game that night like it's the World Series for one simple reason. For some young man or some young woman, it is. 
That's as right. good as it's, that's as good as it's ever going to get. It's as big as it's ever going to be. And it's the biggest game they're possibly ever going to be involved in. And it might be the last one they're ever involved in. So, so, you know, if you don't have the, the patience and the, the wherewithal to go out there and, and give it that, then I challenge you not to go out there at all. I think that is extremely wise advice and you're so right. You know, so very few get to that spot and uh, keeping that in mind, it's always going to be important for somebody on that field. And hopefully uh, that sticks with folks. Well, Cubby, thank you so much. This has been outstanding. I know we'll certainly enjoy it. You'll inspire a lot of officials here and uh, you know, we hope to see you sometime in the future too. Well, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you giving me the, the chance to talk about, uh, a fortunate career that I had, but more importantly, the chance to pass on some words about Ump's Care. And, and again, uh, umpscare.com, uh, please take the time to visit the website. And whether you decide to purchase a hat or anything, uh, if you get the opportunity to make a donation, we would certainly appreciate it. And I, again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here and kind of tell my story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.